increasingly globalized and pluralistic societies, we are frequently faced with conflicting claims to truth, be it in the day-to-day -day realms of ethics, politics, science, and finance, or in the underlying realms of philosophy and religion. Obviously this is not strictly a modern phenomenon, but it seems to be punctuated by the increased opportunities for communication and connectedness which modern technology has brought. Given this growing awareness of differing ideas, is it naive to assert the truth of a particular idea over and above all contradictory ideas? Is it simply an exercise in reckless audacity to assert that Christianity is the true religion? Joseph Ratzinger, now Pope Benedict XVI, examined this question in depth in a book entitled Truth and Tolerance. I would recommend reading this work in its entirety for a thorough treatment of the subject, but I would like to discuss a few of what I believe to be its most salient points. First, when discussing the place of Christianity in the history of religions, Ratzinger examines the unique character of pure monotheism as a demythologizing force. In its theology of the history of religions, Christianity does not simply take the side of the religious person, take the side of the conservative who keeps to the rules of play of his inherited institution. The Christian rejection of the gods signifies much rather a choice to be on the side of the rebel who for the sake of his conscience dares to break free from what is accustomed. In reality, and also in the phenomenology of religion, God is something different from the gods. And in reality, as we have shown, there is a completely different structure of concepts from that of mysticism. Here, Ratzinger emphasizes the fact that monotheism, properly understood, is fundamentally unlike all other forms of religious expression. The difference between monotheism and polytheism is not simply numerical. The difference between monotheism and the types of mysticism which can be found in religions such as Buddhism is not simply cultural. The worship of the one true God who is the objective ground of all things visible and invisible represents a completely revolutionary phenomenon in the sphere of religions. In the Hebrew scriptures, we see the gods mocked not simply as inappropriate objects of worship, but as imaginary and man-made. The prophet Baruch writes of the gods, Whether one does evil to them or good, they will not be able to repay it. They cannot set up a king or depose one. Likewise, they are not able to give either wealth or money. If one makes a vow to them and does not keep it, they will not require it. They cannot save a man from death or rescue the weak from the strong. They cannot restore sight to a blind man. They cannot rescue a man who is in distress. They cannot take pity on a widow or do good to an orphan. The reason for this blistering mockery, which you can find up and down the scriptures, is not simply a my god is better than yours mentality. It represents an ontological difference in the concept of divinity. The collection of writings known as the wisdom literature of Israel's scriptures, born of its meeting with Greek and Stoic thought, helps to illuminate this difference. Ratzinger says of the wisdom literature, here the faith in a single god is developed and given greater depth, and the criticism of the other gods, which already appears in the prophets, becomes more radical. The meaning of monotheism is further elucidated, and associated with an attempt to understand the world in rational fashion, it becomes more rationally persuasive. It is the concept of wisdom that enables the idea of God and the interpretation of the world to be bracketed together. The rationality that is to be seen in the structure of the world is understood as a reflection of the creative wisdom that has produced it. 
In this proper understanding of monotheism, God is not simply a supreme being among other beings, nor are his attributes arbitrary. God corresponds to the reason inherent in the universe. Now let's take a look at the opening chapter of the Gospel of St. John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. The Greek word, which is translated here as word, is logos, the root of our word logic. Christianity, in its self-understanding, is the religion of Israel brought to fulfillment, and there is perhaps no better illustration of this fulfillment than John 1.14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Here, the one true God, who is revealed as being itself in the great I Am of the burning bush of Exodus, who is the wisdom by which everything was created, enters history. It is no mere accident of history that Christ entered the scene during the decisive meeting of Israel's religion with the rational seriousness of Hellenistic thought. Here, in the person of Christ, a definitive reaching down from above, to use spatial imagery, corresponds to the reaching up from below of philosophy and rationality. One cannot worship a philosophical conjecture, but the self-revealed God speaking and acting in history who corresponds to the seeking of the human intellect can indeed be the object of worship. Referencing Augustine, Ratzinger returns to the question of Christianity as the religio vera, the true religion. According to Augustine and the biblical tradition that is normative for him, Christianity is not based on mythical images and vague notions that are ultimately justified by their political usefulness. Rather, it relates to that divine presence which can be perceived by the rational analysis of reality. In other words, Augustine identifies biblical monotheism with philosophical perceptions concerning the foundations of the world as they developed in various versions in ancient philosophy. This is what is meant when Christianity, from Paul's speech on the Areopagus onward, advances the claim to be the religio vera. What that means is that Christian faith is not based on poetry and politics, the two great sources of religion. It is based on knowledge. It is the worship of that being which is the foundation of everything that exists, the true God. In Christianity, enlightenment has become part of religion and is no longer its opponent. I find this to be an incredibly important point in the consideration of the truth of Christianity. In Christianity, enlightenment has become part of religion and is no longer its opponent. Our modern cultures are characterized by a strong appreciation for enlightenment and reason, but they have largely forgotten the philosophical underpinnings of this appreciation. Many attempts, at least in theory, to reduce reason to the confines of scientific experimentation, but the sphere of reason reaches far beyond the laboratory and even the material world. Experimental results are meaningless without philosophical thought. Philosophical thought is meaningless if there is ultimately no meaning to anything at all. Christianity, in a way unlike all other religions and non-religions, stands resolutely for the primacy of reason. Proclaiming the Lordship of Jesus Christ, the Logos, means that religion is not simply a system of traditions and stories, not just an arbitrary belief in a supreme being not just the practice of mysticism, not just a system of order, but religion is the meeting of a sincere and honest search for the truth with the answer of the ultimate truth behind all things. I am the way and the truth and the life, as we read in the Gospel of St. John. Ratzinger says, the question is whether reason or rationality stands at the beginning of all things and is grounded in the basis of all things or not. The question is whether reality originated on the basis of chance and necessity, and thus from what is irrational, 
That is, whether reason being a chance byproduct of irrationality and floating in an ocean of irrationality is ultimately just as meaningless, or whether the principle that represents the fundamental conviction of Christian faith and of its philosophy remains true, in principio erat verbum, at the beginning of all things stands the creative power of reason. Now as then, Christian faith represents the choice in favor of the priority of reason and of rationality. While all of this can be considered in an abstract manner, the implications are practical and immediate. Every one of us is deeply involved in the business of living. We are in the trenches, constantly faced with decisions. Do these decisions ultimately matter? Is there an ultimate good? What is the end goal of our decisions, our work, our politics, our technology, our relationships? Is anything ultimately right or wrong, or is morality simply a utilitarian invention? These are questions we all must ask, and the answers are of immense practical importance. Science cannot answer these questions. Mystical experiences of the oneness of everything and positive energy cannot answer these questions. Arbitrary belief in a supreme being cannot answer these questions. Mere symbols and metaphors cannot answer these questions. Since these questions are of a rational nature, arising from the intellect, the questions themselves are rendered meaningless unless they are grounded in the primacy of reason. The very fact that we ask such questions reveals a disposition to some objective reality which we call truth. Our intellects are drawn as by a magnet, and it is only in the source of this magnetic attraction that we can ultimately discover the answers to questions about the meaning of everything. If there is a morality which is to be taken seriously, it must be firmly grounded in the objective rationality which lures our intellects. These questions are answered in the person of Jesus Christ. As Ratzinger explains, the primacy of the Logos and the primacy of love proved to be identical. The Logos was seen to be not merely a mathematical reason at the basis of all things, but a creative love taken to the point of becoming sympathy, suffering with the creature. The cosmic aspect of religion, which reverences the creator and the power of being, and its existential aspect, the question of redemption, merged together and became one. Every explanation of reality that cannot at the same time provide a meaningful and comprehensible basis for ethics necessarily remains inadequate. In Christianity, love and truth are inherently inseparable. In our understanding of the creative reason behind all things, love becomes defined and therefore practical. If love can mean whatever we want it to mean, then it becomes a useless idea. For example, if our idea of love is simply avoiding conflict, being nice to people, or preserving comfort at all costs, then the idea of love loses its particular character and ceases to inform our decisions in the distinctive way that it should. Severed from the objective truth, which gives it definition, love becomes a boundless and useless concept. There are many religions and philosophies which teach about truth, love, and morality, but Christianity, properly understood, is the worship of the source of these realities. When the Buddha proposes his Four Noble Truths, one cannot help but echo the words of Pontius Pilate from St. John's Gospel, what is truth? When Confucius states that the object of the superior man is truth, he does not offer to explain how truth is an object. In Jesus Christ we find the answer. Truth, love, justice, beauty, and goodness are the very nature of God. In the crucifixion of Christ, God incarnate, for the redemption of mankind, we find the most perfect exemplification of the love which is God. In the resurrection of Christ from the dead, a fact attested to by the selfless martyrdom of its witnesses. We recognize that transcendent power which creates and sustains the universe, luring our hearts and intellects toward perfect communion with him. 
Christianity is not just another religion. Christianity is not finally interested in the preservation of stories, customs, or wise teachings for their own sake. Christianity is not finally interested in preserving morality or societal order for their own sake. Christianity is finally interested in seeking the truth at all costs, with the conviction that when the truth is our highest concern, all else will be rightly ordered. The truth transcends culture, location, and even history itself, which is why Christ's church can properly be called Catholic which means universal. The church is not for a particular group of people, but for everyone. A Christian might acknowledge and even celebrate the fragments of truth which can be found in all the world's religions and philosophies, but must stubbornly refuse to be finally satisfied with anything less than the absolute.